We are on Turtle Island, a land that has brought life and prosperity to indigenous peoples for over 10,000 years. We are all guests on this land. No one can be its owner, though many have tried to take ownership of this land. We would like to thank indigenous peoples for deepening our understanding that we don't own the land. We are in relationship with the land. Greetings. My name is Dylan Corbett, and I'm the executive director of the Hope Porter Institute, a Catholic advocacy and action organization located here on the U.S.-Mexico border in our sister cities of Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, and El Paso, Texas. Hi, my name is Alex Vernon with University of Detroit Mercy School of Law. Hi, my name is Marc-Andre Veselovsky. I'm a Jesuit in formation working with Jesuit Refugee Service Canada in Montreal. There's no right way to asylum. Imagine you are a parent of a family from Honduras. Gang members threaten to kill your children if you don't pay them a sum of money you don't have. You are forced to flee from your home. By the help of smugglers, you manage to get to Mexico. Once there, what do you think is the best thing to do for the safety of your family? You could ask for asylum in Mexico. You could return to your home country. Or you could continue your journey to the United States. Those are your three options. Take a moment to choose what you would do. Here's what would happen if you chose to ask for asylum in Mexico. You are detained until your hearing, which could take many months and will determine if you are a Convention refugee. Here's what would happen if you chose to return to Honduras. You are tracked down by the street gang that was persecuting you. They kill you and your family. If you chose to continue to the United States, you make it to the USA-Mexico border, but you have to decide whether you ask for asylum at a regular border entry at customs, or enter the USA irregularly, avoiding customs. Those are your two options. Take a moment to choose one. If you chose to seek asylum at customs, because of COVID-19, the USA does not accept asylum claims at the border. You are sent back to Honduras. Here's what would happen if you chose to enter the USA irregularly. You risk death because you have to cross a desert or the Rio Grande. Or you may be arrested and prosecuted in the courts. You could claim asylum if the authorities don't catch you first. There's no right way 
to asylum in the USA. Greetings again from the US-Mexico border. In this presentation, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what it's like for migrants who are seeking to enter the United States in terms of the policies that will impact them when they get here, in terms of the treatment that they can expect, and also in terms of what they can expect in terms of their right to migrate. Now to do that, I wanna share a few facts and figures first, but to do that, I'll need to share my screen. Now, according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, in 2019, there were approximately 80 million persons who had been forcibly displaced. Of those, 46 million were displaced from their own communities and forced to seek safety and security in another part of their country. And 26 million persons were refugees. That is, people who were forced to seek safety and security in another country, not their own. Now, means that in the world last year, in 2019, approximately 1% of the world was on the move, forced to seek safety and security outside of their own community. Here at the US-Mexico border last year, there were about 1 million persons who either turned themselves in at the border or apprehended by border officials. Now, that's just a small fraction of the 80 million persons displaced around the globe. And it means that what we're seeing here at the border, a worldwide issue of migration that will require global solutions to be able to address it. I want to tell you the story of my friends Francisco and Gaspar, who were two of those one million persons who came to the border last year. This is Francisco and this is Gaspar. Francisco and Gaspar are both from Ishil indigenous communities in Guatemala. Most migration here at the border is from three countries in Central America, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Although migrants from all around the world also come here. In Central America, there are many factors that are driving migration. There's violence connected to criminal gangs and drug trafficking. There's climate change. There's lack of economic development and opportunities for young people. And there's competition for natural resources that's driving many indigenous communities, like the communities of Francisco and Gaspar, off their land. Francisco and Gaspar have both fought to protect their communities from mega agricultural projects, like the mass planting of African palm trees that are right now displacing indigenous communities and sending their members up to the US-Mexico border. These mega agricultural projects use up potable water, they pollute the environment, and they force communities like the communities of Francisco and Gaspar off their land. Because this is often done by multinational companies in collusion or with the cooperation of local government, activists like Francisco and Gaspar have been forced to flee their countries for their lives. Last year, they came to our border community here in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, but they were forced to seek asylum from Mexico under a new policy known as the Migrant Protection Protocols, or Remain in Mexico, which started last year. Under Remain in Mexico, asylum seekers must negotiate a very difficult and complex and broken immigration system in the United States, but from communities in Mexico that don't have the shelter, economies, or safely to be able to integrate them. Now, Francisco and Gaspar have been in Ciudad Juarez fighting for their asylum case for over a year. And their, realistically, their asylum case has no end in sight. And this isn't uncommon for the thousands of people who have been sent back to Northern Mexican cities like Ciudad Juarez. Remain in Mexico is a violation to the rights of migrants and a threat to their, and a threat to their lives and welfare. Communities in Northern Mexico like Ciudad Juarez don't have the infrastructure to provide shelter and services to a growing population of refugees at the US-Mexico border. Many migrants have been returned to Ciudad Juarez and they've suffered robbery, assault, kidnapping, extortion, trafficking, and even murder. While in Mexico, Francisco and Gaspar have been assaulted by the police 
and they've also been kidnapped. Stop immigration at the border, even at the cost of violating the rights of asylum seekers like Francisco and Gaspar. The strategy of the US government at the border over the past de several decades has been to stop immigration by criminalizing migrants and by militarizing the border. Criminalizing migrants by arresting, detaining, and deporting them. And militarizing the border with walls, increased surveillance, and border agents, things that affect border communities like mine in El Paso, Texas. Let me give you an example. In my community of El Paso, just to the west of us, the US government right now is finishing the construction of a new border wall, 53 miles in just two counties, and $700 million. That's almost a billion dollars. Now, compare that to the foreign assistance that we've given to strengthen a country like Guatemala so that people don't have to migrate. Only $220 million in 2019. Many indigenous communities in Guatemala rely, rely on growing coffee for their income. Now in 2018, the entire yield in all the country was less than $700 million for coffee. In other words, all the exports for co of coffee from Guatemala amounted to $700 million for growers and pickers of coffee in Guatemala. So that means that for the cost of just 53 miles of border wall, we could give every grower and picker of coffee in Guatemala a 100% raise. Our investments in criminalization and militarization just don't make fiscal sense and they don't make moral sense. People of faith recognize that is the right to migrate, the right to migrate to protect yourself and your family, the right to migrate to provide a better life for yourself and your family. The reality is that criminalization and militarization are not working and they're not humane. We need something new. And we need you to develop new, humane, moral and sustainable solutions to the worldwide question of migration. And thank you for taking time during this teaching to consider how you will respond. Let's say you make it to the USA and start an asylum claim. You're told that you will most likely not succeed with your claim and start looking for other options. You hear that it's easier to receive an asylum claim in Canada. You could try your chance of heading north, but how do you choose to get there? Do you enter Canada by a regular land point of entry, that is through customs? Do you fly to Canada? Or do you enter Canada through an irregular entry, walking across the border, avoiding customs? Those are your three options. Take a moment now to choose one of them, the one you think is the safest. Now, if you chose option one, passing through a regular point of entry, here's what would happen. Unless you have family in Canada, you'll be automatically turned back to the USA and put in detention. Here's what would happen if you chose option two, flying. If you try to book a flight and don't have a visa to come to Canada, you won't even be able to buy a ticket. If you get illegal documents to try and buy a ticket, Canada has authorities that will prevent you from boarding your plane. 
Now, if you chose option three, walking into Canada through an irregular point of entry, that is avoiding customs. Before COVID-19, you could walk across the border irregularly and ask for asylum. But because of new restrictions, authorities will put you in USA detention if you are caught. Now, you could manage to get to Canada irregularly as long as you don't get caught crossing the border. And if you do, you can get to an asylum claim office in a city in Canada and start an asylum claim. However, since 2019, the Canadian government enforces a new rule such that if you start an asylum claim in the USA, you can't start a claim in Canada. You risk deportation and detention. There's no right way to asylum in Canada. I'm Professor Alex Vernon from University of Detroit Mercy School of Law, speaking to you from the traditional territories of the Confederacy of the Three Fires, comprised of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Bodawatomi nations. Detroit Mercy Law is located at the Detroit Riverfront, across the river from Windsor, Canada. My clinic students have a unique vantage point to see the interplay of U.S. and Canadian refugee policy. All too often, they work with refugees who are detained in the United States after having been rejected at the Canadian border, because for most, there is no right way to seek refugee protection in Canada. This may be startling for those of you who have seen images of Canadian leaders welcoming refugees resettled directly from overseas. In fact, the Pew Research Foundation says that Canada has surpassed the US and now leads the world in refugee resettlement. Hello, hello. Welcome to Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to see you. Oh, yes, and it's our pleasure. This is a wonderful night where we get to show not just uh, a plane load of new Canadians what Canada's all about, but we get to show the world uh, how uh, to open our hearts uh, and welcome in people who are uh, fleeing uh, extraordinarily difficult situations. We've got some stuff for you. Tonight they step off the plane as refugees uh, but they walk out of this terminal, terminal as permanent residents of Canada with social insurance numbers, uh, with uh, health cards, uh, and with an opportunity uh, to become full Canadians. Yeah. Welcome to Canada. <laughs> How to thank you. you are home. Thank you. Despite this, the reality is that Canada has long been content to pick and choose the refugees it will resettle, while relying on geography and U.S. policy to filter out those who would seek Canada's protection of their own accord. When President Trump announced the Muslim travel ban in January 2017, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau tweeted, to those fleeing persecution, terror, and war, Canadians will welcome you, regardless of your faith. Diversity is our strength. Welcome to Canada. Very quickly, what had been a trickle of refugees soon turned into hundreds, daily braving ter the barren terrain and frigid temperatures in attempts to reach Canada, deliberately crossing at unauthorized points of entry only to immediately turn themselves into Canadian officials and claim refugee status. They are images that are hard to forget. Asylum seekers with luggage in tow, crossing from the U.S. into rural Quebec on foot. 
Under the Safe Third Country Agreement, this is the only way they can seek asylum in Canada, because if they arrive at an official border crossing from the U.S., they'd be turned back and asked to seek asylum there. Today, a federal court judge ruled that violates their human rights. This ruling is, is not only significant, it is, it is groundbreaking. Amnesty International Canada is one of the groups that was part of the court challenge. This has been years now, really since day two after Donald Trump uh, took office. Uh, groups have been calling on the Canadian government to take this step. I think people did see those images uh, of kids in cages in the U.S., of families being separated in the U.S. And people don't realize that our immigration system is intimately tied up with the U.S. immigration system in many ways. And the agreement is one of those. The federal court justice ruled the way the U.S. imprisons refugee claimants violates the Charter of Rights. Today, those who work to help refugees resettle are welcoming the decision. When people are seeking safety, they're simply seeking safety. We're really happy to see this decision. Today, the Minister of Public Safety stood by the agreement. Um, we were very, always mindful of our international convention obligations to those seeking refuge. The Conservatives want the government to appeal today's ruling and to strengthen the agreement. We have urged the Liberals for years now to negotiate with the United States uh, uh, repair and, and fixes for the loopholes in the safe uh, third country agreement. The federal government is now reviewing the decision and has six months to respond. Until then, the agreement remains in place. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. Most people don't hear the stories of those who attempted to go to Canada via the official Canadian ports of entry only to be sent back to the United States pursuant to the safe third country agreement between the two countries. Seeking haven in Canada the legal way resulted, paradoxically, in many of them being detained in U.S. jails facing removal to their country of feared persecution. The safe third country agreement is basically an agreement whereby Canada and the United States recognize each other as safe countries for asylum seekers. And they require most asylum seekers to seek protection in the first of those countries that they arrive in. Obviously for most, that will be the United States. The only people that can make refugee claims at official land ports of entry are unaccompanied minors or people with certain relatives in Canada or people charged with a capital offense and facing the death penalty. Also, there's a curious exception that means people from Mexico and Hong Kong can make claims at the land border. The Federal Court of Canada has found that the Safe Third Country Agreement violates the Constitution of Canada, but the Government of Canada is appealing the decision, so it remains in effect. Refugee claimants who come to Canadian land ports of entry from the United States are being sent back, unless they have an exception to the Safe Third Country Agreement. This is regardless of the merits of their claim for protection. And that's why people have been crossing irregularly into Canada, because once inside Canada, the agreement doesn't apply to them. Except, now the Canadian government, much like the US and other countries, is using public health laws to expel most irregular crossers back into the United States, using the pandemic as a pretext. Even if you manage to make it into Canada despite all of this, the Canadian government is now denying access to the full refugee process for most people who have already made claims in the United States. It's important to note that there is still an opportunity for refugees to request protection before being removed from Canada, but with less procedural and legal safeguards. So it's very hard to just walk up to Canada and seek protection. What if you have the resources to fly in? Well, besides an airplane ticket, most people fleeing persecution will need visas. That is, they will need immigration paperwork allowing them to get on a plane and come to visit Canada or the United States. In order to get a visa, you have to convince a consular officer that you only intend to visit, and you will leave at the end of your stay. Usually these consular officers are skeptical. They may want to see proof that you have a job or property or immediate family remaining in your home country that you're gonna to want to get back to. 
So if you're fleeing for your life, you can't really tell them that because they will say no. What if you successfully obtain a visa or manage to buy fake documents to escape with? The Canadian government has migration integrity specialists, essentially interdiction officers stationed overseas whose job it is to prevent people from trying to enter Canada with improper documents. They will also prevent people with documents such as visitors visas who they determine might want to stay and claim refugee status instead of visiting. So there really is no right way for most people fleeing persecution to claim refugee status in Canada. Canada, the US and other countries have policies that force migrants and refugees to feel like criminals, to feel like they have to lie, cheat or sneak to access protection. And this is something that we recognize as being an extreme violation of the right to migrate and ultimately the right to life.